And now moving on to tonight's presentation, Coping with COVID, Short and Long-Term Approaches, presented by Dr. Peter Yellowlease. And Dr. Yellowlease is a professor of psychiatry and chief wellness officer at UC Davis Medical Center, the first to serve such role in the, in the University of California system. And Dr. Yellowlease is a pioneer in telemedicine and international advocate for physician wellness. He's published over 200 papers on topics, including psychiatry, telemedicine, physician burnout, and digital health. And he has over 30 years of experience treating patients, leading healthcare organizations, and championing clinical well-being. In tonight's presentation, Dr. Yellowlease will share strategies for coping during COVID-19. Managing day-to-day -day can be challenging. How can we care for our mental wellness through the period of reopening and responding to the world's new normal? Dr. Yellowlease discusses how to recognize the main stressors related to COVID-19 and understand our reactions to stress. This presentation explores coping in the short term, as well as how to prepare for the long-term effects of the pandemic on the mental health of healthcare workers. Dr. Yellowlease invites you to submit your questions throughout the presentation. Thank you again for joining us this evening, and thank you for all you do to care for the health and well-being of our community. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed, Doug. And uh, Lindsay, if you could just uh, let me uh, have the screen so that I can share my own screen, that would be great. You should be able to share. Good, I'm just going to it right now. Okay. So look, uh, first of all, thank you to everybody who's there listening. And, and I particularly want to thank Aileen, Lindsay and Sam for setting up this uh, month of wellness, which I think is a fabulous idea and a really good response to our inability, I guess, to have the traditional sort of day long uh, uh, exposition of presentations on well-being that the SSVMS has run for several years. And uh, I actually think this, uh, this month of uh, an hour or two uh, every few days is actually a very nice process and we'll see how it goes. Um, but it may be one of the things that we decide to continue in the future, I guess, and maybe one of the silver linings that we're going to see come out of COVID. So um, what's, what I'm going to do today, is, first of all, because this is a CME event, I have some uh, very quick disclosures. That the, in this case, it's because I also am a writer, like uh, Dr. Giroux beforehand, but unfortunately I'm not a good painter, nor can I play music, and, uh, and uh, I've never even attempted poetry. So I, I have certain skills, but, uh, but not nearly as many other skills as we've just seen in the lightning round. But uh, I do have some writing capacity, and, and there's three books here that uh, I've written, all of which are relevant to, to tonight's presentation, um, and uh, which uh, you can see in front of you. Uh, I have no other disclosures. Um, and, and what I'm going to cover tonight is really look at um, the main stressors related to COVID, um, look at how we all as humans uh, respond emotionally and physically to stress, uh, focus a bit on the importance of resilience, look at the coping mechanisms for individuals and groups and how we can support healthcare workers and in particular, look at some of the good things that have come out of COVID, because in fact, there are already some good things coming out of COVID, and we need to be very aware of that. Now, before I get going, I want to just uh, also uh, tell a, a sort of brief, not so much a story, but a set of experiences, because um, as a psychiatrist, I actually see a lot of physicians as patients from all of our health systems. And, and I'm also constantly in contact with physicians uh, in my role as Chief Wellness Officer at UC Davis, and constantly interested in how they're getting on, how they're coping, what sort of things they're doing with themselves and how they're feeling. I mean, it's been very interesting. I mean, we're now at the six month mark with COVID, which is quite extraordinary that we've been going for so long. Um, uh, and, and I think physicians during that time have changed. Um, we started off with most people being somewhat afraid and uncertain. Really people, nobody really knew what to expect from COVID, what, what the implications were going to be, how serious it was going to be. 
And a lot of physicians in particular were terrified and still are frightened, but, but really terrified of, take, of getting infected themselves or taking the infection home to their families. And that was a major, major stress. Um, I, I was really impressed by how many physicians actually really were heroes. And I think uh, that's one of the things that's going to come out of this, uh, this in a positive sense, that people are going to understand the importance of, of healthcare workers in general and physicians in particular. Um, but I, I had stories told to me of numerous physicians around the region here who were really put, putting up with incredible sacrifices uh, to be able to both keep their families safe and, and to continue their work. You know, so living in RVs outside of a home, not, uh, not uh, obviously in the same room as their, as their partners, um, you know, not uh, being able to be close to their children, give them the hugs in the evening, um, li living in hotels, living away from their family uh, or living in the hospital. So a huge amount of self-sacrifice uh, early on. Um, also combined in other people with, with a lot of feelings of guilt. Um, a lot of physicians wanted to do more, uh, but in fact, particularly in some of the interventional specialties, were actually less busy than usual. The same applied uh, especially to, to primary care, uh, where suddenly patients stopped coming uh, to see us in, in a number of different disciplines, unless uh, we were able to switch very rapidly to, to video. Um, so, so now that's all changed a little bit. I mean, all of those feelings are still there. Um, but, but what has really impressed me is the determination and commitment that physicians have been showing. There hasn't in any way been a mass exodus, um, uh, but I do think people are getting tired and frustrated. And I think uh, some, some people are actually getting quite angry and irritable, um, particularly when we look around at the sacrifices that uh, many physicians are making and, uh, and see the, the population uh, in some places in this country uh, obviously still partying, still going out um, and, and still enjoying themselves and potentially putting themselves at risk and thereby us and our colleagues at risk. It's probable that about 900 healthcare workers have actually died of COVID uh, and that includes between 100 and 200 physicians. And, and so there are quite a number of people who are sort of feeling like they're almost suffering from a sort of moral injury. Uh, in, in that, uh, you know, we're looking at, at people behaving badly um, and it's very frustrating and, and uh, upsetting for, uh, for, enough, for quite a number of people. So, so I've watched this sort of process going on over the last six months. And, um, but it's also led to me to thinking about what are the good things that are going to come out of COVID? Um, uh, and I think the first one is actually an understanding of the importance of healthcare workers. Um, you know, uh, the labeling of essential actually is something we are all very proud of and should be proud of. Um, and, and I think people have suddenly understood um, that, uh, you know, behind HIPAA and behind, you know, the sort of privacy of a lot of what we do as professionals, uh, there are humans and there are people who are who are heroes in themselves and, and who are putting in extraordinary efforts to, to help their colleagues. I think the second big, big advantage is clearly going to be our use of uh, video and other IT solutions uh, to help uh, both see patients and to connect with each other, um, to hold meetings, to hold conferences. And there's no doubt that for many physicians, um, the, the, the future, from a clinical perspective is going to be very different from the past because we're going to be using a whole lot of uh, video related and other IT solutions to see our patients, um, to, to have our meetings. Um, we're probably going to end up traveling less generally um, and, uh, and, and we'll be working in very different ways. I think the third big advantage um, that is coming out of COVID is actually within health systems uh, the, the transparency of messaging that has gone on. And certainly at UC Davis, that's been very clear. Um, and the leadership has, in my view, uh, done a really good job of keeping us all informed with multiple emails and messages per week, telling us exactly what's going on, you know, how many uh, patients are in the hospital, how many tests have been positive, 
um, and really keeping us up to date uh, with uh, with our local situation. And I and, and my impression is that other health systems have been doing the same and have really and have really focused on messaging and communication with uh, with their staff. And finally, the other. The other big silver lining, I think, is going to be in our uh, future management of infectious diseases. Um, it's obvious that already people now understand the importance of, of hand hygiene in hospitals. You don't have to argue anymore to get somebody to, to clean their hands. Um, but, but equally importantly um, is the importance of public health and public health approaches to, to health care. And, and in America in particular, my impression, having worked on in, in three different uh, continents now during my career, is that public health has never had um, the emphasis or the importance placed upon it uh, in the States as it has in, certainly in Australia and in, and in Britain where I've been previously. And I think um, that we have perhaps now finally woken up to the importance of public health. Um, and I hope that that's something that will continue in the future. So sure, there's a lot of problems with COVID. Nobody's arguing that. But I think we've also got to look very carefully at, at what are the silver linings? What are the, the things that we can take home and we can focus on now to, to try and uh, improve things in the future? Now, I always like to find a good quote. This is a really obvious one. If we had a massive pandemic tomorrow, all of us would be in serious trouble. Uh, this is uh, Anthony Fauci, who everybody I'm sure knows very well. Uh, the only problem is he said this in 2008. And uh, unfortunately, things really hadn't changed much uh, between uh, in, in the last 12 years uh, when, uh, when, when the coronavirus hit us. Um, to, to compare the, uh, the COVID-19 with other pandemics, um, if you look at the, the sort of uh, ob the, the obviously infectious ones, with the exception of HIV AIDS, where there has been over a million deaths, you can see that uh, COVID-19, uh, in terms of the current uh, death toll of, as, as of today of about 184,000 and, and 6 million infections, um, is, is really um, now way, way more serious than any other uh, pandemic that's hit the United States, apart from the 1918 influenza H1N1 uh, pandemic, which it's estimated probably led to about 675,000 deaths in this country and up to 10 million around the world. Um, so this is obviously a major pandemic, as everybody knows, and I just, it's always interesting just to look at, uh, you know, how uh, its comparisons with the other pandemics that some of us have lived through. Now, what are the stressors for uh, physicians and, and other healthcare professionals in particular? Um, there's a long list of them. I won't go into them in huge detail, um, but um, certainly the constant change and uncertainty, this fear of transmission, um, changing policies has been very stressful, particularly some of the uh, uh, the, the sort of really extraordinary interactions between politicians and the CDC um, and uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the quite, uh, you know, in, inexplicable, I guess, uh, changes in, in policy from the CDC as a result. Um, uh, the, the lack of PPE, the lack of testing, uh, obviously at a local level anxiety about people's families and friends, um, uh, either increased or reduced uh, work demands uh, and clearly all of the, the, the sort of re issues related to separation and social supports uh, as we shelter in place and, and for many people very severe economic work and, and social changes and I've read some articles you know look, suggesting that somewhere between you know 70 and 100,000 primary care physicians may in fact not return to work or may, may have just gone in a different direction as a result of COVID. So we, we had shortages in certain areas prior to COVID. I think the shortages in those areas are likely to be even greater afterwards and I'm really not sure we're prepared for those. Um, so what other things does a pandemic do to us? Obviously there's, there's the the, the disruption to, to, to our daily living and any personal fear or loss. Um, there's a loss of equilibrium to individuals and communities and, and, and in some cases to whole geographic region. Uh, there's clearly uh, economic devastation and then the ripple effects on, uh, in the mental health area. And we know that uh, levels of depression, anxiety, substance use, domestic violence and suicide 
um, are all uh, on the rise, unfortunately. Now, if you want to look at the mental health side, um, the CDC publishes a very good uh, weekly morbidity and mortality weekly report. And the one from, the, from August the 14th focused on mental health um, and gave uh, a lot of statistics around the types of disorders that are happening, um, particularly as people are, are staying in their homes uh, and, uh, and, and unable to, in, in many cases, get care, despite the capacity for, uh, for many people to now video conference into those environments. Inevitably, uh, it's the, the patients who are uh, poor, who are black, who are brown, and, and, and who, who have um, less uh, social supports, less, uh, less, less capacity to, uh, to, to look after themselves, who are, who are missing out on care. Now, what about the normal disaster response? I talked a little bit about the, what I've been seeing in the physicians, and, and you can see how that's actually mirrored uh, by uh, the, this, uh, this curve that um, has been shown to occur in disaster after disaster after disaster. So the, the typical uh, way that we see disasters happening is as a, usually a pre-disaster warning or threat phase then a sort of heroic initial response where people do amazing things and, uh, and you get these extraordinary stories of survival. Uh, then, then unfortunately, we, we move into what's often thought of being the trough of dis disillusionment, um, where, whereby things uh, are not so good and, uh, and, and uh, the people really are getting hit by the, the reality and the implications of a disaster. And then finally, there's reconstruction um, and uh, and people starting a new beginning, all the time triggered by certain events, memories, anniversary reactions. Now with the pandemic, this is uh, obviously slightly different because uh, it's first of all, it's a chronic disaster and it carries on. Secondly, it's likely we're going to have um, another uh, major uh, set of, uh, of infections, another, another phase uh, come October, November, unfortunately. So um, at one level, we're, we're, also, we're also continuously in this sort of pre-disaster warning phase. And then obviously in our current situation, it's made worse by everything else that's going on, by the division in the country, um, by the uh, sort of uh, systemic racism and, and injustice that is being shown. Um, and then uh, on top of all that, as you all know, um, the, the fires recently and uh, down south, uh, floods and, uh, and hurricanes. So it, and it seems there's just so many things going on that people just don't know where to look or what's gonna happen next. Um, now, when people are in a disaster, um, the, uh, at the actual time of disaster, they have certain priorities and the main priority is survival followed by their own safety and security, then getting food, clothing, and shelter. And quite honestly, health and well-being is not very far up their, uh, their actual hierarchy of needs. Um, uh, other people have uh, talked about this hierarchy of needs more recently and have included Wi-Fi's and batteries as being uh, very essential uh, right down at the bottom of this, uh, this hierarchy. Um, and uh, I think there's actually something to be said for that nowadays because we are so dependent uh, on our uh, phones in particular. Now, uh, how have pandemics may be managed in the past? This is a photograph of a military hospital from uh, 1918. Not surprising that there was uh, such an extraordinary uh, infection spread of uh, the flu in those times. Um, and uh, also in 1918, there were some public health attempts clearly to try and reduce the spread of infection. Uh, here's a sign in a naval aircraft factory in Philadelphia, uh, encouraging people not to spit uh, as a way of uh, stopping the spread of, the, of what was called the Spanish influenza in those days, although it seems most likely that it actually started in, in Kansas. Um, so, so let me focus a little bit on this disillusionment phase, because I think that's where we are right now, and that's what we have to think about in terms of coping. Um, typically, this goes on for most disasters for two months to two years, um, and, and it's, uh, we see strong feelings of disappointment, anger, and, and resentment. The reality of losses is, is becoming uh, obvious, 
um, disaster assistance agencies pull out and the survivors feel abandoned. And we see that with the uh, inadequate federal response at the moment and the, and the pulling out of uh, all of the financial supports that uh, is happening right now. Uh, where, where people are still uh, clearly in, in very difficult times. Uh, there's often, unfortunately, a loss of a, the sort of feeling of a shared community um, as uh, survivors concentrate on building individual lives rather than so much working with, it, with others. Um, and again, obviously, um, you know, we've, uh, it is all different in the current situation because of the potential recurrence of the pandemic. Uh, with likely uh, to come with the next flu season. So, so we, again, it's hard to predict where we're going to go. Um, uh, but in theory, what I would hope we would do, assuming that we eventually get a vaccine and some better treatments, is we'll enter a reconstruction phase. And this is where we know that ultimately we're going to have to solve a lot of the problems ourselves. This can go on for years. Um, gradually, people's beliefs in their community and their capabilities will return. Um, uh, there will be long-term investments, um, but, but still obviously stressors and, and health problems and exacerbating a, of, of pre-existing medical conditions. Um, so there is, there's no question in my mind that we're going to get through this, that we will continue on and that eventually COVID will become you know, one of the infections that we get vaccinated against uh, each time that fall comes around. Um, but it's going to take a while and we're going to go through this uh, series of processes. Um, now, we're, we're in the later phases now for what uh, people generally describe as a reaction timeline. And I've mentioned quite a few of these, um, but, uh, but particularly I think this, uh, this fatigue and frustration is something that I've been picking up very, very much in a lot of physicians. Um, how do we intervene? What should we do? First of all, we need to actually make sure people know that this is actually normal. These reactions are pretty normal. They're not necessarily sick or, or unusual to be having these uh, sorts of reactions. Uh, it's important to validate and, if, and affirm people's emotional responses. Um, you know, I constantly have patients saying to me, oh, it's just uh, dreadful and life is awful. And I just agree with them. I, I, don't, uh, I don't try and uh, change the view. I say, yeah, it's a really weird time. It's very strange. We're all having difficulties. And then we, then we try and talk about, you know, how to respond. Um, facts are very important. Um, honesty and, and straightforwardness with people. Um, there are a lot of coping strategies I'll go into in a few minutes. Um, uh, and we should really be aiming uh, as physicians, not necessarily to try and get people back to being, you know, 100% healthy, um, but we should, be, we should be trying to at least get them back to whatever was their pre-pandemic level of functioning um, and use the pre-pandemic level, perhaps in, in, in many patients, as being the level we should aim for first. Now, some of this is about control. There's a nice little... Uh, cartoon here um, about things that you can control, okay? So you can control your sleep when you ask for help, what you eat, the boundaries you set, who you follow, and, and how you speak to yourself. And I think it's very sensible to, to think about the things you can control and grasp hold of them and, uh, and, and be careful about that um, and, and gain as much control over your life as you can, even although there's this sort of external lack of control going on. Now, as healthcare workers, we're all different. We respond individually. Um, uh, and um, I think in the long run, we'll actually change our practices and we'll probably cope much better in the long term because a lot of us are going to learn a great deal from what's been going on here. Um, but if, uh, if we just look at the different generations of physicians, it's not surprising that we, we cope differently and re we react differently. Um, I've recently had a paper published with Dr. Nakagawa, who's a, a fellow who works with me at UC Davis, looking at why we think millennial physicians may be less at risk uh, for burnout and stress than baby boomers. And um, if uh, you look at this impossible slide, which I'm deliberately putting up here, not because I want you to read the whole slide, um, but because I want you to think about the wide range of ages of people who are in the involved in healthcare, both as uh, patients and uh, as providers. And of course, it, it follows the whole 
uh, distribution of ages in our population. But we have uh, the baby boomers who were born between 1946 to 1964 uh, are typically the, the most powerful current uh, generation within healthcare, making most of the decisions. Um, and, and their defining product, we, we thought, was the, probably the color television. Um, uh, they like to communicate by phone. Um, and they like to learn uh, in lectures and textbooks. If we compare them with millennials and, and the Gen Z people who are, are now our medical students and residents uh, and young physicians, um, they have very different attitudes and approaches um, and very different influences on them. And so uh, not surprisingly, they're going to react in rather different ways. And if we now look at this same slide, uh, presented uh, in pictures, you can you can look at the different um, essentially influential machines that uh, the the traditionalist baby boomers and Gen X people had. He was the TVs and and uh, uh, Walkmans versus uh, obviously the phone primarily, and then think about the difference uh, for everybody from Gen X onwards who've had paper records. Uh, whereas now we obviously have electronic records and uh, we have Alexa and, uh, and, and multiple apps on our phones. And these uh, on the right of your screen are the norm for uh, our millennials and Gen Z members of the uh, medical community. Um, and, and so uh, there's, there's really a, a significant digital divide within ourselves. And so we have to just be very aware of that and, and know that uh, we're going to respond differently to different types of stresses and need particularly communications done in different ways. So rapidly um, looking at the different types of reactions to stress, there are essentially a series of emotional reactions um, uh, which uh, I've put down here and which are, are fairly obvious to most people, everything from grief and loss to a loss of confidence, uh, fear and anxiety. Um, but bearing in mind that uh, many people actually have positive reactions to stress, uh, so that they start to appreciate their, their life, their family, and they uh, uh, maybe strengthen their spiritual beliefs or, or become more socially connected. So, so we have all of these emotional reactions to stress, um, and then we have a whole series of physical reactions. Uh, I won't go into all of the sort of uh, biology of things, but uh, we all know about the, front, the fight or flight mechanism um, and uh, the different changes that we get. Uh, we, and, and particularly one, one area I want to emphasize is sleep and the importance of sleep and, and the fact that there is very clear evidence that, uh, that most people do need somewhere between six and eight hours sleep. And that if we start getting chronically sleep deprived, we're much more likely to uh, respond badly to, to pressure situations. So a whole series of physical reactions. Um, now, how do we get over that? There are lots of different ways, very simple. Um, and uh, Rajiv Mesquita did a very nice presentation at the beginning of the, the session tonight uh, on, uh, on mindfulness. Um, so all sorts of different uh, self-care using um, adaptive approaches that you can see here uh, listed, everything from leisure activities and hobbies to, to uh, more support from your friends and families through to yoga, tai chi um, and uh, meditating, meditating act types of activities. So an awful lot of very straightforward self-care approaches. Um, uh, the, um, but equally importantly, quite honestly, in this time is to avoid maladaptive coping. Um, so working excessively, not taking breaks, binging on food, alcohol, gambling, sex, whatever. Um, and, and also tending to focus on the negative or overgeneralizing our fears. Um, I think some people actually spend way too much time watching the news and uh, getting uh, overly tied up with, uh, with those uh, with, with, with the rather bizarre things that are, that are being produced uh, on our airways nowadays. And, and so, uh, again, avoid maladaptive coping as much as, uh, as do positive things. Um, now, um, Rajiv talked about the power of meditation. There's no doubt that uh, you, you can really help yourself with meditation. I actually encourage patients to use apps. Um, CBT-I Coach from a VA is a great app that is used uh, pretty widely now. It has a whole series of very straightforward meditation, mindfulness, and breathing techniques. 
Um, in other good apps, uh, Mindspace, which is free to healthcare workers, uh, and Calm, and, uh, and you probably have your own as well. Uh, but I think um, it's well worthwhile looking at, uh, at apps and using some of these apps, uh, particularly if you have trouble getting to sleep, because a number of them have got very nice uh, uh, technologies and, 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 uh, and processes available to help you get off to sleep more easily. Now, self-care at work is really important. Here you see a nice uh, picture from UC Davis. Um, uh, and uh, so it's uh, always uh, important to do check-ins with your colleagues, with your families, uh, uh, use music and humor. Again, what has worked for you? Um, do, do what works for you and, and, uh, and don't hesitate in this area. One of the more interesting um, descriptions I've seen of people's um, attitudes during COVID has been this diagram. And um, the, the slides, incidentally, can, are all available for you if you wish to have them through, uh, through Lindsay. Um, but, uh, but this diagram talks about how people can move from the fear zone to the learning zone to the growth zone um, during the actual COVID-19 pandemic. I'm not going to go to, into this in huge detail, um, but it does show how people can change over time, how they initially complained a lot, then they became aware of a situation, didn't complain so much, and they finally started to thank and appreciate others as they moved into the growth zone. So we change over time. And, and I think it's important to consciously think about how are you um, you know, behaving cognitively and coping cognitively, and, and are you in fact growing and, and uh, feeling that, that there are ways you can cope better in the future? That's obviously one of the reasons I'm trying to emphasize some of the positive uh, things we're going to get out of COVID tonight. Now, resilience, um, resilience is an enormous amount is written about resilience, um, but really it's just the capacity to, to um, keep positive functioning following some sort of adversity. It's very simple. And, uh, and we know that physicians are very resilient people. Um, and but when they start medical school, they're actually um, less burnt out and less depressed um, at, at that stage of their career than equivalent other graduate students. Um, there are a whole lot of habits that you can uh, essentially make sure you're practicing to support your resilience. Um, here's a list of them here. Uh, everything from just trying to be optimistic, practice altruism, um, keep up your beliefs, um, embrace your faith and spirituality, use your sense of humor, um, find mentorship, positive role models, and, and learn from most people. Uh, focus on your meaning, um, on, on, on what you want to do with your life. Um, and, 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 don't, and don't actually avoid anxiety provoking situations. So it's, it's actually good to get out of your comfort zone occasionally, it's just as long as you don't do it too much. So there's a lot of lots written about how to actually support people's resilience. And there's nothing wrong with using some of these techniques that are evidence based. Now, uh, this is a, a very nice slide that Dr. Helen Kales, the chair of psychiatry at UC Davis made up as a one pager for uh, healthcare workers during COVID. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into all of the detail of this, um, but uh, the, she, she looked at the challenges for healthcare workers during the pandemic, and then looked at how to give yourself a break, how to cope with anxiety, the importance of meeting your basic needs, staying healthy, um, letting others help you, um, and, and focusing on the positive things. Uh, she she felt very strongly, and I agree with her, that social distancing isn't a great term, and, and we really should be talking about physical distancing and, and social connecting. Um, uh, but uh, And then she also looked at the, the issue of, of the media and, and the importance of staying updated, but not inundated. Um, and finally, remembering that we're all part of uh, a group of people who have a calling, who have a, a, a real meaning in life, um, and, and that taking care of people is a noble experience to do. Um, and we need to just keep remembering that. So I think this is a very nice one pager uh, that uh, you could potentially print off and just have uh, in, either in your purse or on your wall. Now, what do we do about well-being in general 
and uh, putting on my, my hat as Chief Wellness Officer at UC Davis, how do I, uh, what are the sorts of things we're doing uh, during this time? Well, with, first of all, we're using this model that came from Stanford, which focuses on the, uh, trying to support a culture of wellness, making our practice more efficient and supporting personal resilience in the setting of the provision of multiple pathways to care. Um, and so that if physicians need care and they need assistance, it's, it's easy for that to be arranged and it's perfectly okay for that to be arranged. Um, so uh, we, for instance, have, very, uh, have moved quite strongly into the messaging area, sending out uh, a lot of information to people about how, how to cope, tips and tricks, and, and, uh, and the sorts of things that I've been talking about tonight, but in a lot more detail. Um, we, we have spent an uh, increasing amount of time setting up peer responder programs. So that if uh, a physician or a nurse or any other clinician uh, is distressed, uh, say a patient is aggressive or there's an un unexpected death or there's some violence or, or something, you know, that, that inevitably happens in healthcare, there are people around who are available to uh, support that individual using the principles of psychological first aid, which are primarily to listen to the person um, to check in with them, to follow up with them, and then to refer them to for specialty care if necessary. But this is a listening exercise, it's not a therapy exercise. And so um, at, at UC Davis, we've been very fortunate in having Michelle Lindenberger, who is a nurse who, who has been doing this and setting up the nurses for, with uh, peer responder systems for uh, about eight years now. And we're uh, now in the process of training quite a number of physicians in the same process. And our hope is to have, you know, probably 100 plus physicians trained as peer responders within the next six months or so. So that uh, if there are uh, in difficulties that anybody's having, there's always going to be somebody around in their discipline uh, or someone available who, who can uh, sit down with people when they're distressed. Uh, now, technology, big change, obviously. Um, this is actually my uh, home office. Um, and this is actually, this is from where I'm giving this talk. Uh, you'll see that I actually don't have a uh, traditional uh, computer. Uh, I have an iPad, I have a laptop, I have a smartphone, and I have just a, a, a single screen at the back that I can plug any of those into if I want to have a bigger uh, screen in front of me. Um, but I live in a completely mobile environment, and that's the way that people are going to be working in the future. Um, the number of uh, smartphones and tablets uh, sold around the world uh, is actually now over 10 billion compared with the world's population of 7 billion. Um, uh, and uh, something like 80% of the population around the world has access now to a smartphone. So we're going to be delivering healthcare via mobile devices in the future. I have absolutely no doubt about that. Um, and, uh, and I think that's just how, how we're going to be working. And certainly this sort of setup that I have here allows me to see patients, have meetings, do anything I want. Uh, I can run uh, typically three or four different video systems on the three separate uh, devices, uh, as well as access the EMR, my email, uh, messaging, anything else at the same time. And so I think the flexibility of multiple devices uh, is, is extraordinary um, and much better than using a traditional computer with uh, maybe some extra screens. Um, now, I mentioned that one of the, high, one of the advantages of uh, the COVID has been the move to telehealth. Um, the actual numbers are quite astonishing. Um, this, this is the uh, figures for the month of May uh, 2020, and you'll see that the number of consultations uh, in, that were paid for by private insurers in this country uh, in that month went up by almost 6,000% compared with the year before. Um, and that um, the, off those consultations, about 40% were for mental health um, and 60% were for primarily um, a, a small number of specialty areas uh, and primary care. Um, but an extraordinary change. And certainly many health systems are now looking at uh, moving into a long-term uh, process uh, post-COVID whereby 
uh, they will be having probably at least 30% of all outpatient consultations across all disciplines on average being done by video or, or phone or some other uh, synchronous or asynchronous technology. So extraordinary change. Um, now, video visits themselves, and I'm a tremendous advocate having been working on video for uh, literally almost 30 years now with patients, have a huge number of advantages for, for providers. We know that patients have always liked them, um, but providers have, have many advantages too. Uh, and incidentally, if you look at this picture here, you'll see this is my setup at work where I have a traditional old computer with three screens. Um, now, there are, there are obvious time savings and cost savings from video. Um, even though people talk about Zoom fatigue, I think it's actually less tiring overall using video. Uh, the problem that we have is we tend not to sort of stand up and walk around and, and move so much when we're on video and we'll just go straight from one meeting to the next. Whereas if we've got patients in that we're seeing all day, we tend to be walking around more, we tend to have a little chat with somebody in the corridor um, and we tend to do other things in between visits. And so I think if you actually consciously try and have a few breaks and do things in between visits, you'll find the use of video much less tiring. Um, the quality of work, being able to work from home is, is wonderful. Um, I think you can have really very good relationships and perhaps better relationships if you use technologies with patients because they can get, you can communicate through messaging, potentially through email. Um, uh, and uh, as well as on video. And they can make a choice ultimately whether they wish to come and see you on video or in person. And whilst uh, some people are obviously seeing patients in person now, um, you know, certain, some other clinics are still purely working uh, on technology. Another big advantage of video is that you can actually see more of a variety of patients if you've got a particular interest or expertise. Uh, you can uh, essentially uh, organize a referral base uh, whereby people can see you, even although they live further away. We know there are also improvements in, in safety and the capacity to work in teams, to see families who, who are perhaps in different places. And finally, very important for physicians is there's enormous geographic and scheduling flexibility. I suspect that uh, to a great extent, that the five day, nine, nine to five or eight to six uh, working week for many physicians uh, will be gone uh, after COVID and that we're going to have large numbers of people who will decide that they actually want to work one or two evenings a week but maybe have only a four-day working week or that they want to work uh, part of the time at weekends and, and have some more time off during the week. Um, patients frequently want to be seen outside of traditional working hours and uh, this, this uh, all uh, gives physicians the ability to, uh, to work differently, to be more independent, autonomous, and potentially have, have a better uh, work-life balance and well-being. So, so finishing up, um, I want you to just mention uh, Ikigai, which is a, a Japanese philosophy um, that uh, essentially comes from the island of Okinawa, where there are more centena centenarians uh, living than in any other place in the world. And the philosophy of Ikigai uh, is fourfold. And it essentially says that you should be doing you know, that which you love, that which you're good at, that which you can be paid for, and that which the world needs. And as physicians, we're very fortunate. You know, that really does um, sum uh, us up. It sums us up why we're in medicine, why we learned, why we went to medical school. We have a, a passion, a mission, a profession, and a vocation. And, and so we can, we can focus on these. And we have this advantage as long as we can control our own uh, futures and we can uh, look after ourselves and make sure that we maintain ourselves well. We can uh, potentially, I think, take the, take the philosophy of, of, of Ikigai in a very positive way and look at the, the good things that will come out of COVID. It's not all disaster. Um, and, uh, and move forward uh, and, uh, and get through this, this phase in our lives that we will, of course, never forget. So I'm going to finish at that stage, and I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I uh, hope that that's been of interest to people. Um, and I was just trying to find the um, actual uh, chat room here. Um, so. Uh, 
I will just go through. I'm not seeing any questions, Dr. Yamalese. Um, so if you have any additional questions for him or any of our other presenters, you can always email us at the Medical Society or email Dr. Yalalees directly. Um, last call. Okay, so thank you so much, Dr. Yalalees. Um, it was great to see you this evening and we really appreciate you. Um, so we look forward to, oh, I see a question. I'm going to stop. So um, in, in the Q&A, um, how do we deal with the emotions of kids during COVID? And this question is from Anu. Yeah, I think, um, you know, children obviously are, are very, um, you know, very, how can we put it? Uh, I mean, I mean the, it, it depends a lot on their age, to be quite honest. I think ultimately, I mean, children are very, their, their, their behaviors and their emotions are very different at different ages. Um, and particularly with the uncertainty around schooling and the need for parents to actually try and be also teachers as well as parents in some risk, in some cases. Um, and so, I mean, I think in general, if we assume that the children are sort of at least five or six years old and reasonably able to understand what's going on, um, the best thing is to be straightforward with them and to be honest about what's going on, to explain why they, they have uh, all these restrictions on their lives. And that's what most people have done. Um, uh, and children are actually, on the whole, often very positive about that. Um, you know, a potential silver lining is that actually families are spending a lot more time together. Uh, and, uh, and certainly I've had a number of people who said that it's been wonderful spending a lot more time with their children than they'd ever believed was possible, uh, particularly fathers. Uh, so, so I think, um, you know, there is a potential silver lining there. Um, but, but it's difficult with the emotion in terms of the emotions. I mean, there, obviously you can manage children on an individual basis, but you have, to, you have to try and separate them out sometimes, maybe move them from one room to the next and, and, and pay special attention to, to certain uh, children or certain issues. Um, and I think what, one of the things that I always like is just trying to spend good time with the children doing interesting things, not sitting necessarily watching TV or doing video games but actually go back to playing some old fashioned games, some Monopoly, some Scrabble, um, and getting the kids excited by those sorts of games, um, which are interactive and which allow you to also talk to the kids during the actual game themselves and are much less passive than a lot of the more electronic games that we have most of the time nowadays. So I try and uh, take those sorts of approaches. Um, and, um, you know, but again, as I say, it depends enormously on the age of the children. Okay, we have one more question, Dr. Yellowlees. Um, a couple more questions. Um, so I'll go to the chat box first. Um, how can you help your teenager adjust to moving to a new city, new school, and not being able to make new friends and being the new girl? I think that is just really hard. And that's the first thing to say to the child, <laughs> that it is really hard and to be honest with them. And if they've just moved to a new city, you probably have too. So you've probably got some of the same problems um, and you're probably going through a lot of the same processes. Um, uh, but obviously, you know, it, it, if, you can, if you can combine some uh, in-person activities, um, you know, with appropriate social distancing, then obviously that's a good thing to do. Uh, and many schools are doing that. Many schools are taking a hybrid approach to teaching. Um, the social side of, of education is very important, clearly. Um, and, you know, it is being restricted at the moment. Uh, but I think, you know, be honest and try and uh, be positive about the fact that this is going to change and we will get through this and um, and and admit the difficulties that you might be having yourself and and try and you know work it out with them uh, and then uh, I've seen there's another question uh, on here from uh, from Caroline um, about the uh, suggestions to cope with the dissolution of boundaries between work and home um, 
And I think that's um, a really important question. Uh, it, and it's very hard to um, be completely present at all times uh, when you're in a, a home environment and, and odd things are going on. I mean, we have two dogs and the dogs actually are delighted that we've been at home so much in the last six months, um, but they want to be in the room with us all the time. And whilst 90% of the time they're really good and they just lie down under, the, under my desk and, you know, sort of uh, make sure they're close to me, they occasionally get up and start barking. <laughs> and, and, and that can be disruptive. Um, and, you know, so I've actually introduced my dogs to a couple of patients and, uh, you know, it's, uh, there, are, there are sometimes when you've just got to run with, with difficulties. And, um, you know, I think it is harder to be, to be as fully focused on occasions. Um, and, and, you know, I don't know that there's an easy answer to that, quite honestly. Um, then the next question is how to avoid breakdown of community with other providers when, when the other providers doing most of their video or work by video. I mean, I think, Bill, that's a really important question. Um, the, um, I, I actually think we have to just spend more time and uh, more attention on our friendships and our relationships with other uh, people, whether it's uh, our colleagues, our, uh, our friends, our family. Um, I have a group of uh, friends across the country um, that I've developed over the years through my academic activities. And we've deliberately set up, um, you know, a sort of Zoom session uh, once every few weeks. I've got about four or five of those sessions going with different groups of friends at the moment. Um, and uh, on a, in a couple of the, the instances, I'm actually seeing these friends more frequently than I would normally, um, where I might just meet up with them at a conference once or twice a year and then, you know, a few emails in between. Um, so I think you have to, um, you know, just try and see who's valuable, spend time with people who you really like. Um, don't, don't necessarily spend a whole lot of time with people who are purely acquaintances. Um, and um, and, and focus on, you know, what people do you, do you really want to interact with? Um, now, there's a question from, from Paul. With video visits, how do we teach boomer physicians how to adjust from our prior 3D visual cues, which we don't get to a two-dimensional screen? I'm not 100% sure what you mean by that, Paul. Um, but if you mean that the, the, the um, as a boomer physician, it's harder to, to pick up the immediate visual cues, I think you're probably right. Um, I think what we do know about the um, cognitive capacity of the Gen Z and millennials um, is that they um, tend to literally think differently and respond differently from the way I might and, and you might from your question point of view. Um, and they, they do actually uh, like to um, sort of, you know, multitask a bit more. They like things to be done quickly. They want everything in, in sort of 15 or 20 second bites. Um, they don't necessarily want the length of the explanation that, that we might require. And so the, they do have different cognitive approaches and they learn differently from the way that we learn, much more visual learners than, than written learners. So I think, I think these are things we're going to have to learn ourselves. Um, and so now I see you've, 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 you're talking about the in-person exam on the two-dimensional screen uh, and how, may, how difficult it may be asking patients to position differently. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it, is, it is more difficult to clearly do physical exams uh, on, on video. Um, there are actually a series of guidelines as to how to do that, including guidelines for a complete neurological examination that actually goes into uh, great depth. If you, if you look up the, um, there's a, a series of books from the Royal Society of Medicine uh, in, uh, in Britain that have, uh, written, that, that have been written that actually look at a number of these sorts of aspects.
And then a comment from uh, from Anu about how we need to spend time with our friends and checking in on them. Um, I think that's that's absolutely true. I mean, if if there's a single single point that maybe people can take away from tonight, um, it's that um, we need to help each other. We need to. This is not something that we can just do by ourselves, and we need to um, you know collaborate with each other to communicate and to support each other. Um, and if we can do that, showing uh, you know empathy and compassion. Um, and we know that compassion, for instance, is, uh, is actually not only good for the person who you're delivering it to, but is actually good for us as well, uh, then, then to me, that's, uh, that's a very positive way through. <laughs>